So this is our lab meeting, and we'll get started in just a minute or so. Again, the same sort of rules apply if you could. Uh, just keep those videos off like we did during lecture. That's great. Uh, so I don't have so many boxes on my screen and stuff like that. And again, if you do have questions about anything as we go along, uh, you can use the chat box to, again, ask it so that everybody can see. Or again, if you want to kind of privately type something, uh, you can do that to me as well. And like I said, I, I will see them. And if I'm talking about something else, I will come back to your question just in case um, <clears throat> as well. Also, a reminder, our lab ones, when we do meet like this, uh, will also be recorded. Uh, so again, if there's something of importance, uh, they will also probably end up online as well on our Canvas page slash YouTube link type of thing. Um, so again, like we talked about before, just be respectful of everybody right with any comments or anything that you may have. And again, like I said, in a minute or so, we'll, we'll start talking a little bit about the lab. And again, uh, the one that we are scheduled to do today, if I'm not mistaken, should be the kinetics activity, uh, which is essentially, I won't say an Excel exercise, but uh, you'll essentially do pretty much all of it through Excel or a program like Excel. But I just want to take a little bit of the beginning here to talk about some of the stuff that you'll probably see in there and hopefully maybe uh, answer some of the questions that you might have about uh, some of the interesting things like pseudo rate constants and, and things of that nature. So like I said, we'll, we'll get officially started here in just a minute and uh, go over all that kind of stuff. Then afterwards, uh, you know, obviously you're welcome to uh, start working on it, which I would probably recommend uh, using this time to work on it after we're done talking. Uh, that way, again, I'll be here for a while and you can pop back in if you want and ask a question if you have a question or something like that, and you can still kind of get your questions answered. Okay, so let us uh, <clears throat> let us talk about uh, sort of the experiment, and uh, let's see here. So in today's experiment that's scheduled, which is I think uh, the uh, kinetics activity. You essentially have uh, several parts to this experiment. Uh, so going off the top of my head here, since I can't open too many screens here, but uh, I think uh, there's part A, perhaps B, and I want to say C, or one, two, and three parts to it. And what you'll see in each of those parts is uh, you'll see a uh, you'll see a bunch of tables, if I'm not mistaken. So you'll see some tables that have some information about it. Uh, I think it's time and sort of uh, concentration type of uh, and really the ultimate goal in this uh, experiment is uh, since they kind of gave you all the data for all these parts years ago you used to actually do the physical experiment get the data and then do all these parts your goal I think in this ex in this experiment is to figure out the order of these reactions and also uh, the rate constant. And just a reminder that uh, when we talk about the orders, there's the first order, right? There's second order. And there is zero order in terms of your options usually. 
And when we talk about each of these, refresh, please. So when we talk about sort of the uh, first order reaction, when we talk about the little second term over time, um, it goes with our interior Experiment with questions on sort of those guys. Obviously with those guys you had uh you had some <clears throat> uh, half life equations right that went with it and so forth. So in this experiment you're gonna be given data. So for example, I believe uh the first one, part one or A, whatever it's labeled, I think you have maybe three sets of data at three different temperatures. And the first thing you're going to try to figure out is the order, and you're going to try to figure it out really graphically. So what you'll essentially have to do is for each of those tables, you will have to make each of those graphs that we see up here. So we'll call it uh, maybe a different color, but so we'll call this guy uh, graph number one, graph number two, and graph number three. So for each of the tables that you have, uh, you're going to have to make a graph for each of those tables. You're going to have to make a graph of one, a graph of two, and a graph of number three for each of the information in there. Which means if you have the concentration for the first order one, you then need to use Excel to make it the natural, uh, the natural log of the concentration. For first order, you're going to have to calculate that. And so you're going to have to use the experiment, use Excel to calculations for you. You're going to have to do those graphs and your natural sign. You are one away for top and four. So you can do your idea. You can do your idea. It's important for this experiment, and that is because the R squared value is that linear coefficient, and that R squared value tells you which one is the most linear. And obviously, one is perfectly linear when you get an R squared value equal to one. That means it is perfectly linear. So for each of the tables and each of the parts, you're going to have to lay up all three of these graphs. They all need to be obviously properly labeled. They need titles. They need to show the equation. They need to have the R squared value for each of them. And then once you determine Let's just say, for example, that the first order graph had an R squared value closest to one. What that would tell you is that the reaction is first order with respect to this example, A. Okay. And you can use the slope of that line to get the rate constant. So if it was first order, it would equal minus k. And this k that you get, the rate constant that you would get from this graph, is one that you might see in the little thing with the little prime next to it. This is what it needs to go for it. So first off, any questions so far up to this point? And we're going to talk right now about sort of the pseudo ray constant and what to do with that. Okay, so you're gonna make all three of those graphs. You're gonna use the R squared value to determine which one's most linear. You're gonna determine the order of the reaction based on which one is closest to one out of those three. And when you take the slope of it, that is gonna give you not really your rate constant in this case, but it's going to give you really what is known as the pseudo rate constant. So let's just talk a little bit about sort of the pseudo rate constant. So let's take, for example, this reaction here. 
for example, this reaction here. And if we write the rate law for it, the rate would be equal K times the concentration of CH3Br to the X and OH minus to the Y. And remember when we write rate laws, it is only the reactants that are involved. So don't get that confused with the equilibrium constant. It is just the reactants that are involved when we do this. Now, if we did this reaction, and let's just say, for example, that we have very high concentration, and because we made this, did this in some way, in this case, sort of excess, such a big enough concentration that ultimately over the entire reaction, it pretty much remained constant. What that does is essentially sets up a situation, if we look at our rate law over here, obviously this is a rate constant. So we can write a, and we could call that, and it would something like, so what you do is you know, so that's very much like what you're going to be doing when you do all those graphs. Each of those experiments in the activity today and each of those parts were set up in a way that one of the reactants was essentially in excess. So it was pretty much constant as the reaction was taking place. So really essentially what you're doing is looking at just, uh, just our uh, CH3Br in this case. So when you do that, information is set up in a way where really it only takes so high that it pretty much didn't change over. So now there's both of the reactants in this case. Kind of the information that you have in your tables and kind of the graphs that you are going to make really only takes into account, for example, one reactor. You really want to re relate the rate constant to both reactors. Now, the this experiment, without making the hydroxide so large, you know, they both would probably participate in the reaction and have an effect on the rate. So the way you're able to do that is because of this relationship here, you could solve for this. And that's essentially what you're going to have to do in each of those uh, parts of the experiment after you make your graph and after you figure out your pseudo rate constant you then need to pretty much do this calculation here so the way it works out in general for everything in that experiment is to find the actual rate constant you need to take the pseudo rate constant that comes from your graph and you need to divide it by the concentration, and I'll just use A, for example, of the other reactant. To its order. So, for example, let's say that there's roughly Now, I tell you, the reactant is equal to the part A, part B, and part C. So sometimes people get very confused when they do this sort of activity because there's like pseudo rate constants, there's like regular rate constants. So just to reiterate here, everything that you have in each of those tables that you see you're going to be making, again, three individual graphs for each of the tables, one that represents the first order graph, one that represents the second order graph, and one that re represents the zero order graph. You're then going to use the R squared value to determine which one is the most linear, the one that is closest to one. And that will give you the order of the reaction with respect to A, for example, whatever one you're graphing. And you're going to use the slope of that line to figure out, again, not the actual rate constant for the overall reaction, 
but what is known again as the pseudo rate constant. And that pseudo rate constant is going to come from your graph. And again, this is pseudo rate constant because of the way the experiment was set up. They made one of the reactants pretty much in excess, which means it's going to have no effect. It's not going to change as the reaction is happening. Uh, so you're only really looking at one reactant at a time. And that's what's represented by those graphs that you make. You then need to do a calculation like I just explained down here to turn that rate constant that you get from your graph into the actual rate constant that takes into account not just the one reactant, but all the reactants that are happening there. And then you will get a rate constant for each of those tables. So you'll first get a pseudo rate constant for each of those tables, and then you'll get a, an actual rate constant for each of those tables. Any questions on that? Okay, so once you do all that fun stuff, throw your computer out the window, whatever you want to do there, probably don't do that. Um, and you get all of those three rate constants. Again, one for each of these, oops, one for each of these graphs that you have your first order, your second order, and your zero order. You will have at that point in the experiment when you get there, I'm just going to go uh, and I apologize. I don't know if it's part one or part A. I'm just going to call it the part A. And if I remember correctly, you should have one table at temperature one. You should have a second table, I believe, at temperature two. And you should have a third table at temperature three, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And a reminder that for each of these tables, you will need to make those three graphs. So just doing the math there, that is three, six, nine graphs you'll need to make for part A. One, again, three graphs for each of those tables, the first order graph, the second order graph, and the zero order graph. You'll need those three graphs for each of these tables that you have. And when you're all done and do all stations, and if you remember, so once you get to your table, again, wow, I love Excel at this point. You're essentially going to take the slope of the line, and it will equal again minus E of A over R. So to find the activation energy, it will be minus M, which is your slope times R, which is your constant, and that will give you your activation energy, which I believe is what they're asking you to solve for, in joules, yeah? And so if you want it in kilojoules, you need to convert it to kilojoules. Again, it's in joules because R is in joules, yeah? Joules per mole, basically, is what it's in, yeah? Question on that funness, yes? Any questions on any part of that? So for each of the tables that you have for each of those parts, you need to make, again, all three of those graphs, first order, second order, and zero order. You will then need to determine the order of the reaction by the one that's most linear. You then will get the pseudo rate constant from the actual graph and the slope value. You then need to do a little calculation, which is essentially taking the pseudo rate constant divided by the other reactant to its order. And again, the other reactant and its order, its concentration and order, will be given to you in the writing part in each of those uh, parts right before the tables. And that will get you the rate constant for each of those uh, temperatures. And then you'll have a rate constant for each of those temperatures. You also need to use Excel to take the natural log of the rate constant and take one over the temperature. And again, I don't recall off the top of my head, and I apologize, I don't have it right in front of me, but if the temperature obviously in those tables are not in Kelvin, you need to make sure you convert them to Kelvin. Um, 
and then take one over T, do an X, Y scatter plot, get a new equation. And when you take the slope of that equation, you're gonna multiply it by 8.314, and that will give you your activation energy in joules. Again, the activation energy will be a positive number because as you can see on the bottom right there, that graph that you make should be negative in terms of the slope. So the negative and negative will turn your activation energy into a positive number. Any questions on any part of that? Now you're going to uh, do that for part A or the first part where there's three tables. If I'm not mistaken, I think when you go to the second part, there's two tables and I may be wrong, but I'm trying to remember because they've changed it a little bit. But I think on the second part where you have, I think just the two tables, I think uh, you may not have to graphically solve for the activation energy, but you may have to use that equation that we use that 2.1 where you take uh, a natural log of K2 over K1 equals E of A over R one over T1 minus one over T2. So I think in, in part B or part two of the experiment, I almost seem to remember maybe you have uh, just uh, two tables. You also, again, need to do all three of the graphs and everything like normal. But I think you may use the equation to solve for it. And again, that's your uh, K2 over K1, natural log E of A over R, one over T1 minus one over T2. So I, I think, seem to remember somewhere, I think in the second part of it, uh, that you maybe don't do the graph, but you do do uh, more uh, mathematically and use the equation to solve. Because the same thing will result in part B, you'll end up with uh, two temperature values and two K values. And again, you wanna make sure you're using the actual K values, not just the pseudo uh, K value or the pseudo rate constant. And then in part C, I almost think there's maybe just one table, I could be wrong. Maybe there's three for part B and two for part C, but, and you're gonna do the same thing. And I don't think they ask you to solve for activation energy, I think, in that one. I think it's just uh, what the order of it is. Any questions on any parts of the experiment? Yeah, so uh, for part A, uh, you, if, if I'm not mistaken, you do have, so uh, to answer your question, <clears throat> In part A, there's three tables, and each of those tables uh, are basically at different temperatures. And um, when you're done with the first part of sort of the data analysis and making the graphs, you will end up with like what we have here uh, for table one and from the graph and the calculation, you'll get an actual rate constant for that that corresponds with that first temperature. And for table two, you'll also get the rate constant that corresponds to the second temperature. And for table three, uh, you'll get that rate constant that corresponds to the third temperature. When you get to this 10th graph, which will answer your question as well, you go, is that uh, this is your Uranus plot. And you're going to use the info from all the three tables. So again, the info from all three tables uh, you'll have one over T. The T here again is temperature, it's not time. So this is temperature, yeah. So it's one over Kelvin. It's, uh, it, where we're graphing on the very last one is, uh, is not time, it's temperature. So it's one over temperature. So remember that temperature affects the rate constant. So as you increase the temperature, the rate goes up, right? And as you decrease the temperature, the rate goes down. And that's what the 10th graph is on that part A, is actually the Arrhenius plot, which is basically the relationship between as the temperature changes, how the rate of that reaction will change. And that's why if you look closely at the three tables in part A, they're at different temperatures. And that's why you're able to make that 10th graph because you have information about three different temperatures that this reaction was done under. So again, the T in the last graph, which on the screen right now is on the bottom there, 
That is not time, but that is temperature, and that needs to be one over Kelvin, which is what this is up here. This is basically what you must want to not. In the nine previous graphs that you make, it is time. A little to left, but in this one, when you get to the temp graph, which is the temperature, uh, it's the one of T, which is the temperature. Other questions on that? So, again, for part A, you should just have one graph at the end there, which is one over temperature. You're going to have three different points in this, in this graph. So, here I'll just make one here, I'll make it really big. This would be like uh, table number one, temperature number two. So you're going to use each of the tables information as one point on that last graph that you're going to make. Does that make sense? And that's why, again, you'll, you'll just have one Arrhenius plot. You're not gonna have three Arrhenius plots. You're just gonna have one. Uh, because basically all that calculation stuff that you're doing for the uh, first several tables, you're doing it really to get the three points that you could plot in that last uh, graph there. Other questions on that? So this was the experiment that I was talking about that has, you know, a ton of graphs. Yeah, so uh, to do it, it's it's pretty it's pretty straightforward once you get going. When you go through like the data analysis, say for part A, and you do all the graphs and all the data analysis before you get to the Arrhenius plot, you will have for table one that is at a certain temperature. The information that you get after you do all the previous graphs and everything for table one is you should get one K value, the rate constant. That corresponds to one temperature in Kelvin. Yeah? And the same thing when you go to table number two, when you go through all the data analysis and the graphs, you'll end up with one rate constant for that table. That corresponds to one temperature in Kelvin for that. Those come from above. In order to make this graph, you are going to have to use Excel probably. And when you go to make this graph, you will need to take these guys and turn them into the natural log of K, which you'll have a number for table one, a number for table two, and a number for table three. And for these guys, since they're in Kelvin, you will have to take and use Excel to turn it into one over the temperature. And again, you'll have a number that corresponds to each of those tables. And these again are going to be your data points that you plot in that last graph. So each of those big circles that I made over here, those would be the three points that you would graph. Again, doing a best fit and an XY scatter plot. Any questions on that? And again, the data analysis should walk you through everything that you sort of need to do, but that's ultimately what you're eventually going to get is again, a K value for each of those tables that correspond to a temperature value. And then to make the Arrhenius plot, you need to turn obviously those K values into natural log of Ks and then you need to turn those temperatures into one over the temperature in Kelvin. And those are the three points that you need to plot. Yeah. No problem. Okay, so a good question about the lab report for this one. So let's talk about that. Let's go to a new page here. I'm tired of looking at blue. Let's mix it up a little bit. Yeah, we'll go purple maybe. All right. So for this one, uh, you should have, <clears throat> there should have been, I believe, for the lab report. Obviously, you should have some uh, pre-lab questions, I believe there should be. 
Uh, and I think for this report, what we're going to do is, since there's a lot of data, we're just gonna do a data section for this one. And obviously this is typed. So what I want in the data section is, I want the graphs. So those are all the graphs that you made. Obviously properly labeled, etc. all those things, yeah. They do need to show the equation. To make the graphs and stuff like that. I don't need the, that information. But what I do need is for you to go through, as you go through, obviously, and do all these calculations, you want to make sure whatever the data analysis tells you to calculate. that you put into a table. Okay. So uh, put all the, that information that you calculated, organize it neatly and organized, and put those into tables that you make. But again, I do not need you to make tables of what you see in the lab report or the lab manual or any of those ones that you converted into say natural log of A or natural log of K, one over T, that you just use to make the graphs. I just need the graphs properly labeled with the best fit line on there, the XY scatter plot, the equation, and the R squared value. And then you should make tables that are your own of obviously labeled tables as well of all the important information that you really calculated from those graphs, from the data analysis, and organize those into you know, proper tables. And then uh, just say, uh, maybe just a very brief, uh, yeah, I'm good on that, just that's good. And then uh, we'll do post-lab questions. So obviously there's nothing really to write in terms of carbon pages, so you don't need any carbon pages or anything like that. So I think that's good enough. You don't have to write a results or discussion for this one. You don't have to write a uh, an introduction or anything like that. So you just need really a type data section. Um, obviously uh, some sample calculations if there are some, right? Will sample calc you know, needs to be in there as well. So. Basically a type data section that has all the graphs properly labeled so I know what they are, not like graph one, graph two, graph three. Make sure that the graphs fit on a page. Um, again, you could shrink the graphs down. You don't have to just make one page per graph or anything like that. So you can shrink them down. Don't shrink them down too far that I can't see them, although you will be submitting electronically, so maybe I could blow it up a little bit. But again, don't squish it down too far, uh, but do make sure that they're organized. And again, you need to make your own tables of all the values and stuff that you calculated. And then you need to uh, have the sample calculations, pre-lab and post-lab questions. Yeah, so if you, if you wanna, um, <clears throat> yeah, so for this particular experiment, you don't need to write anything in your notebook. Um, if we normally would have done it in person, uh, you don't have to write anything in your notebook. It really is more of a, uh, online sort of exercise with Excel. Years ago, like I said, we used to actually do it and you would do the experiment first and then make like the 30 graphs. But now you just have to make, I think they cut it down 20 some odd graphs, I think, and all that. Um, so you don't have to write anything in your carbon pages. If you wanna do the pre-lab questions, you can in the carbon pages, or if you've already done it in the carbon pages, that's fine. Uh, the post-lab questions, again, I don't recall off the top of my head sort of uh, what type of questions they are. If there are more questions that you uh, can just type an answer, you could type them. If they're calculations, then uh, you could do those by hand or a combination thereof. If it's if the post-lab questions are sort of uh, typed answers and calculations, you can do a combination of that. Yeah, so uh, when, you, uh, when you do, uh, I'll put it this way, in terms of rounding for sig figs, I think there might be some direction in there as to how to do it, but um, <clears throat> definitely you don't not necessarily have to round too much when you're doing an Excel for it to make the graphs. 
Uh, but when you do like pull off any information from the graphs and put it into the tables that you make uh, for your lab report, for example, yeah, you should round to probably the proper number of sig figs, uh, depending on the numbers and stuff that you have. Uh, you know, if you've done Excel before, which most everybody has here, I think, uh, that uh, if you do a formula calculation in Excel, sometimes it'll give you like 400 significant figures or decimal places. Uh, so obviously don't translate those into your final tables that you make for the report. You know, cut it down to the proper number of digits at that point. When you're making the graphs in Excel though, you could leave them and it'll do the graph fine, but definitely cut down a lot of that, you know, obviously before you go into your final tables that you're gonna turn in. Any other questions on that? Again, uh, there will be a due date for this. Uh, the, the link to post to upload this is already up there. I think I may adjust the due date. I don't remember what I put for the due date for this one. So there is a lot of graphs and stuff that you have to do. So it will take some time to do. Um, but uh, again, for the pre-lab questions or post-lab questions, uh, you could either do it in your carbon pages or you could do it on a piece of paper. A regular piece of paper is fine. Again, though, if the post-lab questions are more questions that are uh, type type answers, please try to type those at least. Any questions on any of that stuff? Okay. So again, a reminder for next week, uh, we will have lecture at our normal time. We will do the whole time lecturing. And then my anticipation is the quiz that we're gonna take on Tuesday will be available during lab time. Um, or at least starting during a period of time uh, when lab would start. Uh, we are moving on again, make sure that you look at the uh, schedule uh, that was posted up on Canvas as well in the module section for the adjusted uh, lecture and lab schedule. I think it says something like uh, revised lecture and lab schedule and it has like 33020 on it. Um, so that one will be sort of the one that we'll be following. Um, and we'll try to take our quiz there on Tuesday, but we're still going to do lecture like normal at the normal time for the normal amount. We'll take a break and then I'll make the quiz available for you probably during that period uh, to take it. And uh, we will be moving on, I think, next week as well to the next experiment, which I think is equilibrium. And again, it might be slightly different than this one. There will be probably some modules that will be put up onto our Canvas site where you could go and kind of walk through the experiment. You'll be given some data to use to do calculations and stuff like that. So we'll talk more about that experiment obviously next week and the quiz will be next week on Tuesday as well. Any questions on anything that we've uh, sort of talked about or anything? Um, to be truthful honest with you, I'm still deciding. I think right now if you go up there, uh, I think it might be like, April 9th or 10th or the following week. I'm gonna probably look at it again and readjust it April 14th. So it might stay at April 14th. I'm just gonna kind of think about, you know, in terms of timing and stuff like that, uh, just to make sure that's enough time for you to kind of do everything like normal. I think it should probably be. So I think I might have already adjusted it to April 14th. And again, I think the first lab report that you still have out there is that's the one that's due down due on the 9th, if I'm not mistaken. So I think on the 9th, uh, that will be when that one will be mistaken, uh, will be due. <clears throat> no problem. Any other questions on anything? Okay, so what I would recommend now is obviously, I would go start cranking out some of this stuff because uh, there's a lot of graphs and stuff that you uh, need to make. I am gonna hang out for obviously a while or so. And if you need help or something like that, you're welcome. You're welcome to hang out here and then keep working on it or pop in and pop out. Um, I'm not sure I'll be here all the way up to 240, but I'll be here for a while at least. Yeah. So again, if you have questions and stuff like that, uh, you could come and ask and I'll try to work something out on the screen if you need be or something like that, okay? Uh, the other thing that you might also see uh, coming through uh, this week before everybody jumps out <laughs> maybe uh, is uh, you may see some type of like little survey type of thing and stuff like that. Um, and it's just usually gonna be probably once a week uh, just maybe two, three little very simple questions, probably not even related to chemistry <laughs> or anything like that. And that's just a way for me to uh, sort of uh, check in with you and you could check in for kind of attendance and stuff like that. So um, if you see like a online survey or something like that, probably come in the next day or so. Uh, just make sure you go on and do that. And that's just a way for me to uh, 
kind of see that you're obviously still participating and kind of for attendance and that type of stuff. In addition to obviously I can see who attended, uh, but that's just another way to kind of check in. Okay, any other questions on any of that stuff? Okay, like I said, I'm just gonna hang out. I'm probably not gonna talk very much. So there'll be some silence. But if you do have questions, feel free to type them in. And like I said, I could write on the screen and stuff like that and help you out if you need. Okay. If you're out or whatever you're doing, have a good rest of the day. Have a good weekend. We'll check you next weekend, uh, next week. But again, I'll still be here for at least an hour or so, I think. Um, again, in case you need to pop in uh, to ask questions or stuff like that. Okay. All right. So if you're out, have a good one. If you're hanging, I'll still have a good one. And just ask your questions if you have them.